Well, good morning, Crossridge. Um, hope you're all enjoying the weather. It's a great day for ducks. Yeah. Uh, but none of us are ducks this morning. Uh, we invite you to uh, stand with us as we worship God this morning. Praise the Lord, ye hands adore Him. Praise Him, angels in the high. Sun and moon rejoice before Him. Praise Him, all ye stars of light. Praise the Lord, for He hath spoken. Worlds his mighty voice obey Laws which never shall be broken For the guidance he hath made Let all creation join the song of praise Let every tongue declare his mighty ways we will sing of your goodness and mercy all of our days. Praise the Lord for he is glorious. Never shall his promise fail. God has made his saints victorious. Sin and death shall not prevail All creation join the song of praise Let every tongue declare His mighty ways We will sing of Your goodness and mercy All of our days Only 
Jesus spotless Whose blood washes white as snow Only Jesus Who with his final breath Said it is finished Who conquered death to save my soul
to judge the living and the dead. All eyes will look on your glorious face, shining like the sun. Who is like you, God? To our God be the glory, to our God be praised, He alone, the name above all names. I will boast ever only in the Lord, my God, for I know His glory is mine. My Father's glory revealed in Jesus Christ And the more that I behold Him, the more He satisfies And when I gaze upon His beauty and I see Him as I should Then my eyes are lifted upward for His glory and my good hope in every trial for I can trust the Lord and I will turn my heart towards Him and help me bear the thorn and so in faith I follow Jesus on the road not understood for I know that He is working for His glory in my
pray that we would, you would give us help to believe that. Um, in the light of all that we do in our lives and in the light of all the things that happen to us, Father, would you preach to our hearts this morning that the best thing for us is not us doing things, uh, but the best thing for us is to just get a grasp and get a taste uh, of the glory of yourself and the glory of Jesus. And so, Father, we pray this morning as we submit our hearts and our minds now to your word that you would just reveal more of your glory to us, that we would appreciate, that we would rest, and that we would enjoy you. God, thank you for your love and for this place. We ask all these things, praying them in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, before you have a seat, I see a lot of new faces. Greet those new faces for those of you that are old faces. <laughs> or young faces. I don't know how to say it. Just kidding. Glad you're able to meet some new folks. This is actually a good thing. If we haven't met, my name's Andy, and I do things like that all the time, and they should not give me a microphone. But either way, I work here at the church, and the lead pastor is on vacation in Chicago right now, so I get to do whatever I please. Um, one of the things that I get to do once in a while, and it's such a good thing, and we get to do this a lot here, are child dedications. Um, and at Cross, ooh, that was a this is a big reveal. This is a quick reveal. Um, one of the things we don't do here is we don't baptize children. We commit as parents, as churchgoers, as part of a community together to encourage one another to raise our kids in the fear and the knowledge of Jesus. And so I'm going to invite Kyle and Cheryl Dennis up here with Charlotte, who is five months old almost today. Did she fall asleep? She did. Okay. So I might actually be able to get to hold her while we do this. This is great. Um, yeah, this is an opportunity for us to just commit together. Oh, hi. Oh, I won't wake you. To commit together. Because those of us who are parents, we know this is not an easy task. And the number of times that we have had to rely on other parents to help show the way, as well as for when she's older, for the, com the church community to be able to come around her and encourage her and disciple her as well mm -hmm. uh, is an important thing. And uh, so what we do is we actually, we read a passage of scripture, and as long as my app hasn't crashed, I will have it here for us. We read this in the book of Psalms. Uh, it says, look, children are the heritage of Yahweh. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them, and they shall not be put to shame when they speak with enemies at the gate. And obviously, we don't have a lot of enemies at the gate but this is a reminder that God has given us a great gift in our children, uh, and that as we point them in the right direction, they will head towards Jesus, and that's what we want to do. So the question that we ask of you guys is, is it your desire and your commitment to raise Charlotte uh, in such a way that she would grow to know Jesus as her Savior when the time comes and when the Spirit guides? Yes. yes. It is. That's awesome. And then we turn to you. And we ask you, as the church family, if this is something that you will commit to as well, to encourage, to be praying for Charlotte and the Dennises uh, as they seek to do this as well. And if that is something you're willing to commit to, just say, we will. That's good news. Well, can I see you? Will you come over here? Let's go and see. Hi. Oh, look at you, tiny. Oh, my goodness. I love babies. Let's pray for Charlotte, eh? God, we thank you for Charlotte and for the fact that you have given such a precious gift to Kyle and Cheryl. And God, we thank you for the time that they've had already. And we just pray for uh, an amazing time of growing together as a family. We pray for Charlotte specifically, that you would bring her to know you, that you would, through your spirit, open her eyes to what it is that you have done for her, and that she would come to know and love Jesus all the days of her life. We just pray this in your name. Amen. You did it. Good job. Good job. There we go. Good times. Awesome. And we got like a Bible and a little certificate here for you guys, but yeah. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah. Aww. If your babies are ever fussing in church and you see me, just hand them off. I'm, I'm happy to walk around outside. That's a, this is a weird start to a sermon. So we'll jump right in. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Genesis chapter 26. We are in week two of our series, Straight Lines with Crooked Sticks, taking a look at the life of Jacob in the book of Genesis. We're two weeks in, or this is the second week, into this life of Jacob. So who do you think we're spending most of our time with this morning? That's right, Jacob's father, Isaac. That's right. You got it. You got it. It's such an important piece of the puzzle here, though, so we're going to roll with it. And with that eloquent introduction, we're going to jump in right away because we have a lot to cover this morning. 35 verses. Um, as an aside, when I asked Lee how many of his sermons have been on passages of 35 verses, he just laughed and asked, only 35? And then he pointed out the rest of the sermons that we have coming in this series. There's some long chapters, and we're going to be tackling them. But it is good stuff, I promise. But before we actually jump into that, why don't we pray, and uh, we'll dive into God's Word. God, I thank you for the fact that there is so much to be mined out of Scripture, that when, even when we read a story like we are today that is familiar to so many of us, you have so much more to show us in it. Um, And I know, God, that (laughs) I'm not gonna come close to covering all the things that you have in this amazing story. Uh, And so we just pray, God, that your spirit would fill in the gaps and point us to where we need to go and that we can just trust you to be good. And we pray that in your name, amen. Okay, Genesis 26, starting in verse one, we're gonna go to verse 11 first. We're gonna read this in a few chunks just to kind of break it up a little bit, give us a bit of a breather. Now, there was a famine in the land, besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, and will give to your offspring these lands." And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac settled in Gerar with the men, or pardon me, when the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might have easily lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Okay, this morning, we are going to be looking at what our passage has to say about the promises that God gives to his people. We're going to look at five things that we should keep in mind when we're studying or meditating on and rehearsing the promises that we find in God's word. So from this first part of chapter 26, we first see that God's promises are actually more about him than they are about us. In these first 11 verses, we've got some familiar and some familial stuff going on. If you've spent some time in Genesis, it might feel like this story has already been told, and you'd be right, sort of, just not with Isaac. Back in Genesis 12, we read there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. So before the birth of his children, Abram... Abraham, the father of Judaism, the father of Isaac, he's staying in a land that's experiencing a severe famine. So he goes to Egypt, he and his crew, they go to Egypt to find food and water. And we're told in our passage this morning that this is not that story, which may be an important reminder as these two accounts are eerily similar, both the famine and the promise and the whole wife thing. It's weird. Genesis 12, again, we read this in verse 1. This is what God said to Abraham. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Sounds similar. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and to him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then down in chapter, verse 7, it says, to your offspring, I will give this land. So that little chunk of scripture there is what's known as the Abrahamic covenant. It's the promise that God gave to Abraham saying, if you obey my commands, I will do all this great stuff for you. And when God gives Isaac the same promise in our passage, he says that he will do all that he said he would do because, this is important, because in verse 5, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So God tells Isaac that the promise he gave to Abraham, the promise that he's now giving to Isaac, will be fulfilled, verse 5, because Abraham obeyed God. But is that, is that what happened? Is that what Abraham did? <laughs> Let's dig around a bit more in chapter 12, verse 11. When he, Abraham, was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, sounds familiar, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. So God promised to give Abraham a family, to make him into a great nation. Does what Abraham chose to do sound like obedience? Does this sound like Abraham? That's right. Does this sound like Abraham really believed God? He's listening. I mean, clearly Abraham had faith. Genesis 15, 6 says that Abraham believed and God counted it to him as righteousness. And I'm not up here telling you that scripture is wrong, right? That's, that's not what I'm here. I, we have not just unearthed the thing that disproves all the Bible, right? I say this simply to point out the fact that Abraham wasn't perfect, that God's blessing could not have simply been because Abraham checked all the boxes. Because he didn't. Let's read from Genesis 20. So we've already read in Genesis 12 what happened. Genesis 20. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. And he sojourned. Where? Gerar. The same place. And Abraham said of his wife, she is my sister. Again. And Abimelech. Who? We just, Abimelech, it's a different Abimelech, but the same group of people, Abimelech took Sarah as his wife. Like, not only is it crazy that Abraham did this twice, but that it happens again with his son, Isaac, in the same place with the same group of people. Look at what happens to Isaac. Verse 6 of our passage, Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she's my sister. For he feared to say, my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. Young, single men here today, just avoid those good looking women because <laughs> life is going to be apparently trouble if we take this to be prescriptive. But it's the same thing. Can you believe this? Like, this is one of the, you kind of shake your head here. God gives a promise to two guys. He says, I will be with you. I will bless you. I will take care of you. I will bless the world through your family. They are both men who are married with no children. And they're worried that when people see how good looking their wives are, they're going to be killed. And God's plan will fail. That doesn't sound like obedience or faith. But thankfully, God's promises are actually more about him than they are about us. Like, what do I mean when I say that? Who, let me ask you this, who was ultimately responsible for fulfilling the promise to bless the world through Isaac's descendants? Was it Isaac? Was he responsible? Or was it God's decision, or God's responsibility? Did God keep his word to Abraham because Abraham was such a good guy? No. Because he followed him perfectly? No. Abraham was a sinner just like everybody else. He had his moments of doubt. He had moments of failure. Abraham was not the reason that God kept his word. God was the reason that God kept his word. His promise 
Think about his promise. It was given directly to Abraham and Isaac. It was a promise, though, that they would barely get to see the fulfillment of this side of eternity. Between the two of them, Abraham and Isaac had less than 10 children. Hardly a nation. Hardly offspring numbering as the stars in the heavens, right? They see some prosperity, right? Some land and some goats and servants. But they don't get to see all the nations of the world blessed through their descendants. And that's because God's promise, though spoken to Abraham and Isaac, was not about them. It was about what God was going to do in spite of them, really, regardless of their shortcomings and weaknesses and sinful tendencies. Because when we start to think of our relationship with God, our heavenly Father, when we start to think that that relationship is somehow transactional, that we think as long as we keep up our end of the bargain, I will get this or that, or he owes me this or that. When we do that, we have actually missed the point of the promise that we've been given. Our obedience to him comes as a result of our faith that he is actually able to do and is going to do the things that he says he will. It's not that we obey and he's now somehow obligated to come through for us. Because if that were the case, none of us would ever experience the fulfillment of God's promises. We cannot obey hard enough to earn God's blessing, to earn his favor, to obligate him to save us. We can't do that. Our best efforts, our best living, our holiest obedience. Like think of the best of the best of the best Christians, if you, if you can think of that there's even such a thing like that. But maybe the people who you hold in the highest esteem in the faith, people you might call a saint, those people are incapable of perfection. And perfection, that's the standard. If we wanted to earn salvation from God, we would have to be 100% perfect. We would have to bat a thousand. One of my favorite stats, one of the things that gives me the most hope in the world, not really, one of the things is, it's just, I say stuff like that all the time. I love baseball, I love baseball stats. The batting average. Right, A batting average is a number that represents the number of times a batter hits the ball and reaches base. Now, there's lots of different things around there that might influence that number. Those of you who don't know baseball, what do you think a good batting average is? Five. Five. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Five is wrong. It's a point, something, it's a number that represents a, a percentage Mookie Betts is currently the batting average leader in Major League Baseball, plays for the LA Dodgers. Best hitter in the league is batting 332 right now. Less than a third of the time does he hit the ball and make it to base. He's the best. That's the standard by which everybody else is trying to get to. But that's not enough. We're talking about perfection to earn God's favor, and it's impossible. No one can do that. Not even Abraham did that. Romans 4. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He believed him. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Faith in who? In God, in his faithfulness. God's promises are actually about him to prove to the world that he is the only one who's worthy of worship. And the amazing thing is, as we believe in his faithfulness and as he proves himself to be faithful, bringing glory to himself, as we just sang, his glory is our good. We are blessed as he does this for himself. And when we actually look at the promise that was given to Abraham and Isaac, yes, it's for them. But the blessing that comes in the fulfillment of that promise is something that is meant to point the entire world, not just Abraham and Isaac, the whole world to God's glory, to Jesus. The whole world. Like God's promise wasn't just about Abraham and Isaac. It's not just about us. He loves us. He loves us so much. But none of us are at the center of the universe. None of us. God's promises, while they are for us, they're actually about him and his desire to bless the whole world through his son. We have to keep that in mind as we remember God's promises. 
Secondly, we see that God's promises are often met with ultimately unsuccessful opposition. We read this in verse 12. And Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with them, saying, the water is ours. So he called the, water, pardon me, he called the name of the well Esek, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So Isaac and Rebekah are given special treatment as they stay or sojourn in Gerar. And true to his promise, God blesses them with an incredible harvest. They become incredibly wealthy with possessions and livestock and servants. It sounds like opposition, right? Don't worry, it's, it's coming. Things are going great. They're going so great, in fact, that Abimelech comes and says, you got to get out of here. You're getting too big. So part of the fulfillment of God's promise to Isaac came with opposition. Abimelech asked them to leave, and they do. They move on from where they were. They move on from the wells that were supplying them with life-giving water, right? Like without a well, it doesn't matter how much food and stuff you have for your people and your livestock. Without water, you're all going to die. We know that the area surrounding Gerar used to have wells, wells that were dug by Abraham and his guys. But we're told that after his death, the Philistines went and filled them all in with earth. We're not totally sure why. For whatever reason, though, Isaac is now forced into a region with just defunct wells. So as any good farmer would do, he redigs the wells that his father dug Problem solved. They're back to the fulfillment of God's promise. God is good again. Yay. But no, the herdsmen of Gerar come around and they say that this water's ours. We filled the well, but now no, it's ours. So Isaac moves on and redigs another well and everybody's happy again. No, the guys come again. No, this one's ours too. Get out of here. They come and they start a fight over this well too, or as well. See what I did? Yeah, thank you. <sighs> They finally dig another well that's far enough away from the Philistines that they're left in peace. And we read in verse 22, now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. So God made room for them. He came through on his promise. He is faithful to his promises, but it's not always a straight shot to the mountaintop, right? There's valleys. We know this. It happens all the time. I think of our friends up at Praxis Church. God called a group of people to plant a church in Kelowna. We support them. And as they started down the road of planting, things were going great. They were meeting new people, sharing their faith. They found a great venue in a great part of town. They were finding opportunities to serve their community. They were growing in numbers they hadn't predicted even before they launched. Everything was going great until it wasn't. Members of a community opposed to the Bible's teaching on gender and sexuality began an online and physical protest campaign to disrupt this fledgling church. Was it successful? Ultimately, no, not really. There may be some who were dissuaded from checking Praxis out, but the church has continued to grow. People are coming to faith. People are being baptized. The people in that church are loving and praying for the salvation of those who are protesting, that they would come to experience the blessing that was promised to come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the person of Jesus. God's promises are often met with opposition, but as Jesus himself said when he was talking to Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God's promises are met with opposition. We should expect it. I, I feel like all of my sermons, I get the passages talking about suffering and opposition. That's kind of what I feel like. But that's the world in which we live. The good news is that God is bigger than those things, He's overcome the world. 
And any and all opposition to his purposes are ultimately unsuccessful. That's good news. The third thing we see in our passage is that God's promises are always worth repeating. And this is more of a bonus point than a full-blown point, but we're going to go with it anyway. Verse 23. From there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him that same night and said, I am the God of Abraham your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. That would have been great to be part of that. Like, you know, Isaac started with obedience. He stayed in Gerar and waited on God, but then he kind of turned to his own ways, did the whole she's my sister thing, fell out of grace with the people of Gerar. There's fighting, there's moving, there's all this kind of stuff. And with all that in very recent memory, God appears to him and reminds him of the promise that he made and the fact that he will carry it on to completion. Like, how many of us have prayed for that kind of a moment, right? To have God himself remind us of his promise. Guess what? You guys know this. I love this about our church. You guys already know this. We have that. We have that. I mean, it might not be audible. We might not have God just like show up and be like, hey, this is what I want you to. It might not come in a dream. It might not come just supernaturally, but we have it with us. Some of us have it in paper bound with leather with like gold trim. Some of us have it in an app. Some of us have it memorized, engraved in our minds. We have God's promises to remind us right here, right now. When we read, memorize, sing, rehearse God's promises found in scripture, that is having God tell us what he is going to do and reminding us that he is faithful to do it. That's the truth. His word to us is love, peace, comfort, rebuke, teaching, correction. We have what we need in it and we're hopelessly lost without it. We don't need an angel to be reminded of his promise or his faithfulness to fulfill it. We have it in his word we need to remember, we need to point others to scripture to remind them of this, and we need to celebrate it. Isaac builds an altar here at Beersheba, the same place that his father made a covenant with the old Abimelech from the other passage. He builds an altar and he worships God who continued to stay true to his promise and reminded Isaac that he would keep doing what he was doing. That's what we do every week here. That's what we come together to do. We repeat and rehearse his word to us. Shortly, we're going to be doing this, repeating and rehearsing and remembering through communion. It's God's promise to bring salvation to his people and the fulfillment of it in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So God's promises are always worth repeating. Number four, God's promises often and ultimately always result in our prosperity. Verse 26, when Abimelech went to him from Gerar with uh, who's F? His advisor and Phicol, the commander of his army. Isaac said to them, why have you come to me seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? It's a good question. They said, we plainly see that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there be a sworn pact between you and us and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he, Isaac, made a feast, and they ate and drank, and in the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths. And Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. That same day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug and said to him, we have found water. He called it Sheba, therefore the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. So God's promises sometimes, often, Ultimately, always, but in the here and now we're talking about, they, they, they sometimes result in prosperity. And that's a good point. That's the kind of thing we want to hear, right? I said to the earlier crowd, if there's one thing you can take away from this, this might be it. That God actually does bless us in the here and now. I mean, it might not always feel that way, but it's true. In our passage, after the whole she's my sister thing, after quarreling over wells and having to move from place to place, Isaac and his people come to Beersheba and they settle and they have a place to call their own and God blesses them with security and prosperity, water, growth. Now again, the promise that was given wasn't ultimately about Isaac, right? 
The ultimate fulfillment of this promise was to come in Jesus some 1,700 years later. But God had said to him back in verse 3, sojourn in this land and what? I will be with you and will bless you. And that's what happened. And it wasn't just Isaac who took notice. The Philistines, after having asked Isaac to leave, came to him and said, we clearly see that God has been with you. That's pretty nice, right? Do you wish people came and said that to you? But also, notice they didn't say, they didn't say, we plainly see that you're really good at business and have made some good decisions and made yourself rich and successful. What should we do that be like you? And that was probably true, right? He probably did make some good business decisions. But I don't think he woke up and walked out of his tent and where there had been a handful of goats and, and some servants, there's now herds and flocks and a whole lot of people. Like it wasn't just a magical thing overnight. Regardless of how all that went down, when the Philistines saw that the Lord had been with him and prospered him, it made them a little worried. Because as he grew as a nation, living in such close proximity, if he got too big, he could come and take over their land. So they need to make a pact. It was clear that God had stayed true to his promise to be with Isaac and to bless him. So if we're good Bible reading people, we just take what we read and we apply it directly to our lives and we say, this is how it's going to go for us. So are we to take that to mean that if we believe God's promises and obey his commands, he will tangibly, financially, and physically bless us, or at least bless us in the way that we hoped or thought he would? How's that going for you? Right? <laughs> Of course it doesn't work that way. Point number two was that God's promises are often met with opposition. But, but, there are many of us here who can attest to the fact that when we obey God, when we trust his promises, when we put Jesus' teaching into practice, we are met with blessing immediately. Like in the here and now, following God's word keeps us from all kinds of struggle now. Investing in your marriage and your children, being wise with your resources, living a life shaped by God's word, it comes with actual, tangible, visible blessings. But, and it's a big but, as we like to say, we live in a fallen world and there is suffering all around us. There is sin all around us. Whether that comes from ourselves or from those around us, the effects of that sin have an impact on our lives and can dim the brightness of the blessing that we're actually experiencing. And that's not no blessing, it's just harder to see. It takes more work to appreciate. Like, does that, does that make sense? I hope it does. I'll tell you right now, living a life following Jesus has actual, real life, everyday, noticeable benefits. It's true, I have lived it. Many of you in this room have lived this as well. But ultimately, like if we go back to point one, which was that God's promises are actually more about him than they are about us, as God works out his plan, as he works to fulfill his purpose, as he brings glory to himself, we have the ultimate prosperity. Paul said it this way in Ephesians, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Um... There we go. Oh, the next slide there. Which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Look, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing and that has come as God has worked his will and his promises for his glory and our good. Ultimately, we have eternal prosperity, right? We're looking at heaven. Like, this is a good thing. We can't forget that. I mean, we do. We forget it regularly. But we have to remember that whatever struggle, whatever opposition, whatever trial we are facing, those things will seem as though they were nothing in comparison to what we will have when we actually see Jesus in person. Jesus himself said that the kingdom of God was like a treasure a man found in a field, and in his joy, he goes home and he sells everything that he has so that he can buy that field. And when he buys that field, he buys the treasure that he knows is worth so much more than anything he could ever own, ever. God's promises, and ultimately, 
they ultimately result in our prosperity. And that's really, really, really good news. The last thing, final point, number five. God's promises are often ignored. It's a bit of a kind of a down note to end on here, but we'll, we'll get through it. Verse 34, when Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Some of you who are in-laws in here probably are like, yeah, we understand. I, this is something that I struggled with when I was working through this passage this week. I don't think I'd ever really thought about it before, but Esau and Jacob grew up in the same house, right? Esau, his father was Isaac. Esau was Isaac's favorite. Isaac's father was Abraham. Isaac was Abraham's favorite, right? Esau was the firstborn. Now, we don't see this explicitly in scripture, but I think it's safe to say that if you were the favorite, right, the favorite son, the firstborn son of the one who God called, the one who God set aside to create a people who would be his people, a people through which all the nations of the world would be blessed, do you not think at some point that your dad, who has you as his favorite, is going to tell you this? In fact, as the firstborn, don't you think that at many, many, many points along the way, you would have been sat down by your father and told explicitly all about the blessings that God is going to give you and the blessing that he's going to give the world through you? Of course, of course that's what would have happened. When Isaac was a boy, Abraham would have told him all about it by the fire Isaac would have done the same with Esau, pointing up to the sky at night saying, your family, yours Esau, is going to number as the stars in the heavens. Now, if you were here with us last week or you're familiar with this story, what was Esau's reaction? What was his response to that promise? Genesis 25, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. What use is a birthright to me? Super dramatic. But Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Like it gives a little more context to what it is that he actually despised. Not just that he was the firstborn. God's promise of being a nation, of blessing the whole world, that was not worth a bowl of stew to Esau. The things that he'd heard about and been promised his whole life, the blessing for the whole world, he traded it for beans and bread. Why? Why was this Esau's thing? Why wasn't it Jacob's thing? We know that Esau was Isaac's favorite and that Jacob was Rebekah's. So are we to assume that Rebecca was just a better spiritual parent than Isaac? Like, did Isaac not do enough dinner devotionals with Esau? There are people in this room who have raised children, and some of them have gone on to continue following Jesus, while others have walked away from the faith. But they were brought up in the same house, with the same rules, the same teaching, the same everything. And all the firstborns in here are like, it's not the same everything, man. The middle and the third, they got the same everything. But, but how does that work? Why? Parenting failures? Probably, maybe, yeah, almost certainly. We're not perfect. There are no perfect parents except my wife. But the rest of us, like, I, I don't bring this up to be a discouragement to us. I really, I, I really, really don't want this to be a discouragement to us. But we can't avoid the reality, we can't ignore it, that it doesn't always work the way that we think it's going to. I don't want to weigh us down with bad news before we leave. I actually want us to do this for a couple of good reasons before we finish up. Firstly, for parents and others who are trying so hard to reach their children and their loved ones with the gospel, keep going, keep going. 
but keep going with the understanding that ultimately what happens with their spiritual lives is not up to you. It's not on you ultimately. Do you play a role? Absolutely. Is it an important role? Yes. One that you should take very, very seriously. It should be a priority. It should be the highest priority in our homes. But even if you did everything right, which you couldn't, but if you did, even then, the responsibility for the salvation of our kids, of our loved ones, it still rests on God himself. Wanting that for our children and our loved ones is a good thing. It's something we should fight for and strive for. Following Jesus is God's desire for everyone. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is slow to fulfill his promises. Pardon me, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But not everyone comes to repentance. Lee mentioned last week that he prayed for his mom for 30 years and praise God she came to know him before she passed away. Now, I'm not being flippant here. I'm not making light of anything, but did Lee find the formula? Like, did he get it? Did he pray the right number of times over the course of 30 years? Did he use the right combination of words like we said the last time around? Like, did he make sure he said in Jesus' name every time? Did he mean it just a little bit more than everybody else? No, of course not. Like those who have prayed for loved ones who did not come to know Jesus before it was too late, did they do it wrong? Did they not want it badly enough? Now the truth is that unless God's spirit opens our eyes to the truth that his promise for us, his gift of grace to us through Jesus is so much greater than the world, we're gonna despise it. Just like Esau, for something maybe as simple as a bowl of stew. The second reason I make this point is for all of us to take a minute to examine our lives. Many of us here have come to a place where we've given our lives to Jesus. We believe he died on the cross for our sin and came back to life and has given us his word and his spirit to guide us through this world. But none of us are doing that perfectly. None of us. We're all still selfish. We're all still leaning toward the world. But I'd love for us to ask the question, in what areas of my life am I trading God's promise for a bowl of stew? Like, in what ways am I saying, I want this thing, and I want it regardless of where I'm going to get it. God says, I can find this in him, but that's hard work, and it's not coming the way that I want it to, so I'm going to get it over here. What is that thing? Because the gospel isn't just about salvation from hell and eternity and heaven, though it is about that. It's also about the minutia of today. It's about human flourishing. It's about God having a plan for us, a promise for us that's ultimately about his glory, which is ultimately for our good. So I want to close this morning with a passage from Chad Bird's book, Limping with God. Uh, When I read it this week, I actually thought I should just read Genesis 26, and then this passage from this book would have been a lot shorter and probably a lot more concise, and you wouldn't have been confused in these moments. But it's a great reminder of the fact that not everything is on us, and God's promises are about him, and he's the one responsible for carrying them out. Let me read this for you. It's a little bit long, but we're gonna get there. As you follow Jesus, do not expect your personal weaknesses and unwelcome character traits to disappear. They will not. Do not expect to get everything right all the time. You will not. Do not expect as a disciple that life will be a little easier for you than unbelievers. Most likely it will be more difficult for the world is an unwelcome place for citizens of the kingdom of God. Here is what you can expect. The constant presence of Jesus in your ordinary, predictable, mostly mundane, and often confused life. The life of of discipleship is human life suffused with the unseen presence of Jesus, using you as his hands and feet and mouth to spread his love and truth among fellow sinners. Much of the time, if not most of the time, you will be utterly unaware that he is doing this. You'll think, I am just doing my job, but that job will be Christ's workplace. You'll think, I'm just taking care of my children, but that parenting will be the means by which Jesus raises your children to fear and love and trust him. You'll think, I'm just offering a word of encouragement or extending forgiveness to someone who has wronged me, but those words of mercy and grace will be pregnant with the Spirit's power. We will all fail along the way, sometimes catastrophically, often in ways that hurt many other people. 
we will do selfish, dumb things like Isaac lying about his wife. And like him, we will get caught in our lies, our cheating, our backstabbing, our petty little crusades of revenge or malice. And usually what will happen is that dark forces of hell will slither into our heads and hearts to whisper, God hates you now. You're a lost cause. You're beyond hope. But they lie. They always lie. Falsehood is the only language spoken in hell. Our Father will shut them down and shut them up. He loves you. He will draw you back to him. On this side of the grave, no human is a lost cause. And far from beyond hope, we have hope in Jesus that is beyond measurement. In ways we will likely never realize, the Lord of redemption can create something good and beautiful out of the junkyard of our spoiled pasts. To be a disciple of Jesus is not to have everything figured out, but often to feel like old Isaac, doing what we can to pass on blessings to others, blissfully unaware that the Lord is using us in ways we don't even realize to continue writing the story of his kingdom spread in this world. I like that. Let's pray together. We so often, God, think that everything depends on us. And even when you tell us that it doesn't, we still like to find ways to make it depend on us. God, we pray this morning that we would be reminded that these promises that you've given us are yours and they're about you showing who you are to this world. And that as you do that, as you bring glory to yourself, you bring to us blessing and prosperity that is an amazing, amazing thing. And even as we think of those who we are praying for who don't know you, those who are running from you, those who, like Esau, have despised their birthrights, the blessing that comes from you, God, we pray that you would change hearts, that you would open, through your spirit, open their eyes and allow them to see the amazing promise that they have in you. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we are going to remember now. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to rehearse God's promise together. And we do that through communion each week. We come forward. Uh, people who know Jesus, who are following him, come forward. Take a piece of bread that represents his body that was given for us. You take a cup of juice that represents the blood that he gave for us. You take it back to where you were sitting. And then we'll all take it together after we've had a chance to sing together. Uh, there's a gluten-free option over here on this side as well for those of you who need that. So let's do that together.
The blazing sun shall pierce the night And I will rise among the saints My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face Gospel of Matthew, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take it and eat it. This is my body. Let's do that together. And then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take that together as well.
risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. That's the good news that we get to experience now. It, it really is. And that's what we pray you will go in the understanding and knowledge of this week. As you are going, as I always make you do this, you have to stand and listen to just a couple of announcements that are a reminder of the other blessings that we have. If you are a volunteer here at Crossridge, we have a blessing for you on June 14th. See this up here, remember and celebrate. We get together with all our volunteers over the last year and we remember what God has done and we celebrate. We eat food. That's what we do. Like we get together and we have a party. If you have not yet registered for this as a volunteer, do me a favor, take out your phone. Seriously, take out your phone. You can scan that bar or the QR code there. Go right now, crossridge.church slash remember. Get registered. We would love to have you there with us. It's important. Another thing you can register for if you have children who are moving on from grade five to grade six, we're having a grade five grad, crossridge.church slash grade five grad events happening on June 23rd at 12 p.m. Love to have you there. But sign up so that we know that you're coming. Same thing, if you are a parent of a grade 12 grad or if you are a grade 12 grad, you are not to leave today if you have not registered before you talk to this man right here. We need you to register for this. We are getting together for a good time. Guys, it's at Newlands. It's food. It's a good time and it's for you. Not for me. It's not for, probably for you guys either. It's for grade 12s. So get signed up for this. Talk to AJ. Do not leave before you do. Aside from that, we love you. Go in the knowledge of what we just talked about, that there is blessing that God has for us every single day. We'll see you guys again.